Happy Monday. How's it going, everybody? It's going Happy great. Monday. Welcome, yeah, Devin. Monday. Great. <laughs> What's up, Devin? How are you doing? Good. I'm good. good. How's your weekend? Doing? Good. Oh, my, my weekend was great. Yeah. Um, had, had family in town. The weather was pretty decent. It rained a little bit, so took my daughter out to splash in some puddles and that kind of thing. So, oh, yeah. Where are you located? Kansas City. Kansas City? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, I was in the Bay Area not that long ago, but uh, moved moved back home after COVID struck and that kind of thing. So, hmm. okay, yeah. interesting. Let's talk more about that. You don't meet a lot of people from Kansas City in, in the data world, so it's it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, Matt, how was how was your weekend? It was uh, very nice. It was quite rainy here in New York, actually. <laughs> so, mm. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, enjoyed some time outside. Outside being like you know walking around in parks and such. Versus what? What did you do, Joe? How'd you spend your time? It was a heat wave here, so I spent all my time inside. That's so. Smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think my car said a uh, hundred thirteen at one point. Um, it cooled down to hundred five, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm start driving a bit, but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fine. No, at this point, you just spend spend your time inside, but. Some people running outside just thought it was kind of crazy too, but I don't know. Whatever you're into, I don't care. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, well, awesome. Devin, it's good to have you on. Uh, chatted a bit before. Um, and uh, I guess for uh, people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah. So, um, my name is Devin Peterson. Um, I did my PhD topic in data frames, which is what we're going to be spending the majority of our time talking about today, I think. Um, I did my PhD at Berkeley and I worked with a bunch of wonderful folks and there were a lot of people who, um, you know, contributed a lot to my work and I'll, I'll definitely give a lot of shout outs uh, to them. Uh, prior to that, I did my undergrad at the University of Missouri. Um, so Kansas City is in Missouri. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. It has the name of a different state, but I don't know. We, we don't need to spend time talking about that because that's weird, but um, but yeah, so uh, went back to the University of Missouri, got my undergrad before and before that, I was I was in the Marine Corps actually for for four years. I was a Korean linguist in the Marine Corps. So, oh wow, a okay. little fun fact, yeah. Well, it's a fun fact, and it's just kind of a it's a very different path. I mean, we hear all kinds of unusual paths in data, but this is one of the more unusual ones I've heard. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, don't ask me to ask to like speak any Korean now because I think it, I I don't speak it very well anymore. But uh, yeah, are you based in Korea? No, um, I was stationed in Hawaii, actually. Uh, oh. 3rd Radio Battalion, the Marine Corps, Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. There are worse, but, place um, to be, worse places to be stationed. Yeah, it sounds terrible. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Well, this obviously leads us into our discussion on data frames. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think the kind of level set, really, uh, for the audience, what is a data frame? Yeah, that so that's that is like such a more complex question than than people realize because it, it actually depends on who you talk to. Now I have a very like biased view of what a data frame is because like that was my life for my entire PhD. But um anymore, like people are using data frame to kind of mean like this more imperative way of interacting with your data. You have like this like like kind of uh, you send a, a request for data, you send a query, and you get immediate feedback type of thing instead of like SQL, which is more kind of all or nothing type of thing. So um, in terms of like my research and, and, and in terms of what a data frame is there, um, there is actually like a, a pretty well-defined formalism that we created to kind of define and differentiate the data frame from relational databases and from matrices, which are both kind of distinct and separate in their own ways. So um yeah, happy to dive dive deeper into that, but it, it is such a complex question that I think like it's uh no. like it's it's <laughs> not as it's not as straight. No, no, no. Of course, no, 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 no. It's it's the right question to ask. It is. It is. But well, let me ask you this: it, it, okay, so let me let me maybe get some misconceptions out of the way. Yeah. Um, and I'll just draw some sentences here, or some questions. Is a data frame just a pandas data frame? No. So well, it <laughs> and and that alone is is complex. So okay, no, God, all right. <laughs> Matt, start asking questions. I'm no, 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 no. This, no, this is good. This is this. good because everybody has their own kind of like idea. I don't, I don't know that anybody besides me has been crazy enough to kind of sit down and think about like what is a data frame and try to actually define it. And it takes somebody who's like a little bit, 
crazy to think about something like that because it's not something that like comes up in everyday conversation, right? When you're talking to your friends about data frames or your coworkers about data frames, you don't like define what it is in the same way you don't define what a database is because people just kind of know. But in, in data frames, the kind of preconceptions are so wide and varying that like the, the whole goal of the formalism was to kind of have one conversation or one kind of idea about what the core data frame is. So um, yeah, happy to happy to dive into that though. And in, in terms of the the formalism, yeah, as, as deep yeah, as I we want to dive into it's a it's a deep dive discussion. So I think we're not Matt and I are definitely uh, eager to get as technical as possible. I think the audience is uh, aching for it. Um, got quite a few people showing up here, eighty four right now and counting. So uh, yeah, I would say let's dive in. Sounds so, good. Let, let me say this: I, I think a lot of people who listen are familiar with like various database technologies, including Hadoop, which we were talking about a bit earlier, Devin. And they're also familiar with data frames in the context of Pandas. So maybe you could kind of draw a line between those two, and also talk about some of the past limitations of data frames and why that was a problem, and what you try to do as a PhD student to solve some of those things. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. So I think in terms of like data frames, it's it's good to kind of start with the origins and kind of think about where data frames emerged and, and like what problem they were trying to solve when they first kind of created this this concept of, of a data frame. So um, data frames, not a lot of people know this actually, data frames actually emerged in the language S at Bell Labs uh, in around the 1990 uh, timeframe. And um, S, S for, for those who aren't aware is was closed source. It was it was built at Bell Labs, and then R, which a lot of people are familiar with nowadays, is the open source version of S, basically. So, um, so a lot of the things that we think of and that that started in Bell Labs, which like, if you look back, a lot of things started in Bell Labs. But um, a lot of pe people who who think that things started in R, actually, a lot of those things emerged uh, from S, if that makes sense. So, um, and um, really, what what the, the kind of authors of the book. Um, I don't know. Can I can I share a slide here? Uh, yeah. Which one is that? It's yeah. It's this one. So um, so statistical models in S is uh, is the book that kind of first outlined what a data frame is. This is the first time it's ever been mentioned anywhere in literature, and the idea was to basically support matrix-like computation, but also this kind of relational database style computation. And, and it, was, it was kind of like a table, a, a database table for people who weren't familiar with database tables. It, it, was, it was people who were coming from the matrix and statistical computing world, the kind of scientific computing uh, realm. And they wanted the ability to do things like joins. They wanted the ability to do things that are that that aren't natural in in these matrix-like computations. So I have a really good quote here from uh, from the authors, which kind of really gets at the 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 reason why the 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 data frame emerged as a, a, an entirely new data structure in S. Um, and so. Yeah, I, I think that if you if you read here, it's basically saying that rows are uh, observations and columns are variables. So uh, very, very scientific in, in their way of thinking um, about this. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just it's very interesting. And I, and I always like to share this as, as often as I can, because it's it's just not that well known where it comes from, like who who created the data frame, who was the first we have we have all kinds of names in databases, but we don't have names in the data frame world for like who who started these ideas and who initially created these. So um, anyway, I think this it's important to know the history whenever you're working on something. And so I I thought this would be really really good to share. Do you know what S stands for? No, I don't. I actually don't. Okay. Cool. The, were they like just picking letters? I mean, there's word. a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. letters <laughs> in the in the kind of language world. Uh, from yeah. the languages world, so I wonder if they were just picking a letter. I don't, I don't actually know what what S is. Like stats. Or something I, I thought it was um, something about stats, but I don't. I'll have to go back and look myself. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question, a, a good piece of trivia. I don't know. Yeah, hmm. interesting. It, it, it is fascinating though, because when I when I um, um, read your paper about sort of the, the history and uh, the gory details of um, data frames, and this is about the same time the data warehouse came out. Uh, coincidentally enough. 
so it's interesting that people were taking different approaches to analytics, right? Because because business users, uh, you know, Bill Inman published his book about data warehouses, but at the same time, you know, the, what, what I found fascinating was there's a sort of parallel universe um, that we weren't aware of, or at least just you know, uh, database people, and this was uh, data frames, right? And and, and it's yeah. funny because you fast forward to today, and these worlds have collided, which we can talk about more in a bit. Yes. But that was uh, 33 years in the making or something like that. So, you know, it's enough time to have a child and raise a family. Um, so <laughs> um. that's right. That's right. I mean, things, things. Uh, so databases. Yeah, I think a lot of things just end up in the database. So, um, yeah, we can talk more about that in a bit. But yeah. um, so, it, it is interesting else, that else? they're both kind of emerging at the at, at around the same time. Uh, right. So, right. Sort of. This, OK, go on. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say. So, uh, so we started. We started as you do. Like I was a PhD student, so we started with like trying to understand the history and the background of this, and then we kind of came up with a formalism, and um, and this formalism for the data frame actually lets us kind of map it to different systems. So if we can if we can think about it from from different perspectives, right? If we can think about it from the relational database perspective, or from the linear algebra perspective, right? From matrices and tables, and and how can we kind of abstract things away and, 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 you know, map certain operations between the two to kind of understand where this fits in the, you know, in the whole ecosystem of tools that exist. Right. So, so the formalism, I can, I'm happy to dive, dive deep into the formalism. Yeah, let's talk about the formalism. Um, uh, I think for, for that one, it's, it's good to uh, um, kind of, have a, a visual here. Um, so I think you need to share that. Um, well, yeah, here we go. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, we'll I have. And, um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is from a, uh, yeah, so, so here's the Sorry for the here. audience. We're about to get kind of mathy here. Um, but yeah, you get, you get what you pay for. So <laughs> we've been sparing you this whole time, all these years. <laughs> Well, so we can, so, I mean, the math I think is important. It's important to understand how the math kind of works into what it allows and what it enables. I think like, like math for the sake of math is still interesting to some people and still good. And, I, you know, um, I, I do like math, but in, in terms of this and in terms of like the audience's interest, I, I do think that, um, you know, understanding what the math enables is really important. And I'll, and I will jump into yeah. that, but um, so I, I don't necessarily want to read the formalism to folks. I will kind of, I have, I have some high level explanations about how, how it works here in, in bulleted form, which is a lot easier to consume, I would say, than, than kind of uh, these, these really, really formal definitions. Um, but um, yeah, so, so in general at a high level, um, Data frames are ordered, and and this can be uh, any order. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's sorted. It could be um, just the order that the data came in. It could be the order. It could be really any order. Um, but there is a difference between ordered and sorted in this case. And you can sort. And and so this also means that operations that you do on a data frame have an output order associated with them. So traditionally, whenever you're operating in databases, there's no such thing as order. Um, you know, if you, if you do an operation and, and the, the kind of rows are, are in a different order, it ends up being the same table if, if the rows are in different orders, if that makes sense. Um, there's also no predefined schema necessary in data frames. This is another interesting thing that is very different from the, the database context, because in a, in a database, um, I mean, we've all done UDFs in, in a database. You have to specify the output type before you even are able to run the UDF. Right. If you if you create some uh, user defined function and you want to apply it row wise, you have to say what output type and all of the all of the all of the output types basically for that for that table. And that's because the optimizer has to know the types in order to be able to do the operation. In, in data frames, this isn't necessary. So it's a lot more ad hoc, if that makes sense. Um, the it also has column and row labels. Uh, so row labels or, or a row index is something that um, you know it it emerged as this idea that you can have named rows and you can select rows by their name. 
Um, this is something that's kind of controversial, I think, these days. A, a lot of people don't like the idea of having an index or they don't like Panda, Pandas calls it an index, which is kind of confusing for people who come from databases yeah. because it's not actually an index and it doesn't actually follow like key rules. You can have multiple values that have the same index. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. But uh, the goal here was not to define pandas. The goal here was to define data frames. And so um, there are some things here that don't directly map to pandas, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then and then the final thing here is um, name notation or positional notation indexing. So you can have a so since you have an order, you also have a row row numbers or or a, a number for each row. So you can grab the fifth row or the tenth row or the first five rows or the last five um, dot head or dot tail, right? Those those kind of operations which show you the first five and the last five. Those are those are really really common um, and. And interestingly, it's it's always the same, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, this is this is kind of the the high level data model piece um, that that basically is what this this outlines, if that makes sense. Um, what what's the advantage of having ordering? Because as you were saying, like databases, that's more of like a set of rows mathematically, where in sets you don't have an order for things. So how did, how is this helpful, especially for ad hoc data analysis to have ordering? Yeah, so um, so a lot of people use it for inspecting intermediate results and always seeing the same rows every single time. So if you run dot head, if you, so in, in a database, if you run select star limit five, you, you're not guaranteed to get the same five every time, right? Um, in in a data frame, if you do dot head, you always get the same five every single time. And so, if you're doing if you're if you're doing and in inspecting intermediate results, it's nice to be able to kind of see how those rows have changed throughout the life of your of your kind of building up of your of your entire program, if that makes sense, your entire kind of data analysis program. Um, and that's that's how data frames are used. I mean, um, you know, you, you should pick the tool that's best for the job. And 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 so, in, in terms of ad hoc analysis and, and these kind of exploratory data analysis. It is really, really important to to be able to inter in, excuse me inspect intermediate results and, and kind of see how things are changed. Now that's a good point. It's that interactivity aspect, which, as you point out in your paper that Joe and I looked at um, with SQL, it's, it's just assumed that you're writing a, a query for production, probably that where things won't be materialized until the end. I mean, yeah, you can certainly right. use SQL for EDA, but it's, um, it's I always found data frames were a lot simpler to use because it treats your data kind of like clay in a lot of ways. You can just mold it. You can add whatever columns I want. It doesn't matter because, again, it's, it's kind of arbitrary in that way. Uh, who has a question here? Um, I, I suppose you're probably talking about, well, let me ask the last question first. Curious, does all data frames seen so far start uh, index at zero? And why is that so for ease of operations? I was about to bring up R, but Devin, it's, you're, you're the guest, so I'll let you answer this. Um. So yeah, so there's zero in, there's zero based indexing and one based indexing when it comes to positional notation. Um, in terms of, um, so there's a complex answer here too, which is uh, you know your name notation in what we're calling name notation, which is the, the index, that can also be the same as the positional notation. That's like a special case of the, the row labels. Um, so in that case, then uh, the, the in, I, I, I'm assuming here the index means like a pandas index. So if, if it's not, then, then please correct me. But the idea that this, this index or the row labels uh, start at zero. It doesn't necessarily have to. It can start at whatever number. The positional notation in zero-based indexing languages will always start at zero. The zeroth row will be the first row, and and so on. Um, but but yeah, in terms of the, the the difference, you can have the the names of the rows be whatever you want in in a data frame system. Uh, it could be a date, and and you can kind of select by dates. That's that's really really common in pandas. I know. Um, there's there's lots of different types of in, categorical indexes are also popular in, in pandas too. Mm -hmm. So what else do we need to know about data frames? Well, there is a lot. Um, so in addition to so we just talked about the data model, um, and you know we can 
it, it, it's, it's often helpful to kind of map the data model to different things and kind of talk about the differences. And a lot of people, um, it, for a lot of people, this is a lot easier to kind of rationalize. And so, um, you know, we already talked a bit about how it, how it's different from relational databases. Um, in terms of matrices, it's also different from, from matrices in, that it, it kind of emerged from the scientific computing world. And so in the actual book, Statistical Models in S, um, uh, statistical methods in S. So uh, they they basically talk about how it's different from uh, matrices, specifically because it kind of was was born from matrices, if that makes sense. And that's that's why it's ordered, and that's why it's kind of got this kind of hybrid relational database slash matrix like uh, behavior in it. Uh, but yeah, in addition to the data model, we also we also outlined a data frame algebra. Which is a core set of of operators that uh, that are basically they encompass everything that you would do in in a data frame, um, and so yeah, I, I talk a lot about how pandas has a a, a massive API, um, but this is basically data frame the data frame algebra. It's this set of fifteen operators that basically encompass everything that you would need to do. It encompasses operations from databases. It encompasses operations from matrices. It encompasses a lot of a lot of operations that are effectively like querying metadata, even um, which which isn't something that you typically do in in a relational database. So, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I'm I'm happy to walk through these. I mean, there's 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 not too many, but. Um, yeah, it's. Have you walked through some of the the main ones? If yeah, there are main ones. I'm not sure if they're equally weighted or not, or or not with them. Yeah, so so the, the there's of course like ordered versions of relational database operators, right? The the, the operators that come from relational algebra. There are MapReduce style operations, um, which basically let you do kind of row wise computation. This is this is getting back to kind of the the Hadoop idea or the the kind of Spark idea, um, then there's the ability to um, manipulate and modify metadata and query it as well. Um, so you can pull columns to and from labels. You can select data based on type. Um, this is a lot more of like an anonymous selection. In 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 a in a database, you couldn't do this just with SQL, right? You can you can select a column based on its type you would have to actually outline what column that you're that you're selecting and know up front that it is the type that you want um, and then there are order centric and and kind of linear algebra operations transpose is the one that kind of um a lot of people have a big disagreement about whether or not it should it should kind of exist in in the algebra it's there because it, it's used um but also like historically there are relational there, there is such a thing as like a relational transpose operator in, I mean, databases can do pivots and those require a transpose. So, the, you know, there's, I don't think it's really that kind of crazy to have a, a transpose operator in the, the data frame algebra. But why, why is transpose uh, controversial? Why, why, would, why do people not think that that should be part of the algebra? Uh, so a lot of people, so one of the things that we, we spent a lot of time doing was optimizing for this ability to transpose and to kind of treat rows and columns interchangeably. Uh, and so we actually built a system that could handle um, hundreds of billions of columns. And there just aren't that many systems in the world that can handle that many columns um, just because like you have to have metadata for all of your columns in most systems. And, and we had a way basically of kind of having the metadata be inferred at runtime, which is, which is another, another key aspect of data frames. But having these kind of like, uh, short but really, really fat or wide tables is is not something that's extremely common in the in the kind of world of, of databases, and so um, that's that's kind of why it ended up being like okay the controversial. Um, if, if but you would sense. find this in you would find this in machine learning though. A hundred percent, yeah, a hundred percent, yes. It's it's extremely common in machine learning, but databases don't like that's changing these days because. Yeah, uh, databases are starting to do a lot more, but um, databases have historically not been well optimized for doing machine learning workloads. And so this idea of, of the transpose 
operator existing in in the same world, I think is, um, yeah. I mean, databases would just crash if you tried to yeah. throw a throw hundred billion columns into them. <laughs> well, and, and you mentioned in your paper that a lot of the controversy is around typing because traditionally um, a column has a single type and then when you transpose that the typing gets all messed up, at least traditional typing gets messed up. That's right, that's right, yes. Yeah, that's ex that's exactly right. That is a, that is another key piece of it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but there are also like concat and mask here. Mask is is like basically selecting by uh, row number or or the order position, and, that, and um, concat lets you do basically like a union all. But the interesting thing is that the the columns don't have to all be aligned, so you can kind of add new columns and fill in with nulls or that kind of thing. It's just extremely flexible, right? You don't have to know up front the, the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right. You don't have to know up front whether or not they're gonna, it's gonna work. It's just basically a much more flexible way of interacting with your data. Databases put a lot of constraints on the user to figure stuff out so that they can be fast. I think, and you know, that makes sense. It, it does make sense. It, it makes sense to kind of optimize the system for it's runtime, but I think a lot of a lot of systems people over the years have kind of fallen into that trap. I don't I don't mean to say anything bad about my coworkers, but like the this idea that you know optimizing for the machine, there's only there's only so far it can go. And part of this goal was to kind of optimize for the human time or the human element, and that's that's what the data frame algebra kind of does as well. Is it doesn't put all this all these new constraints on users. It doesn't put all these new requirements to like figure out, you know, your types or name all the columns that you want to select up front or figure out, you know, figure out whether this join is going to work before you actually run it, right? There's there's not any of these constraints on users of the data frame world because it's more it's more there for the EDA. It's more there for like I'm sitting down for the first time and looking at my data and and trying to figure out what's in it. That's that's the the whole goal of the data frame is to get people to be productive and it's to get people to like just be able to sit down and go. And it, so yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll reiterate again. Like you should use the tool that's best for the job, and not necessarily there's not one tool that is the best for everything. And that leads me to bring up something we were talking about earlier, which I think is a major talking point you, you want to get to, which is what is the best API for data? And I think you've actually made some good arguments in favor of data frames, and you probably inadvertently made some good arguments in favor of databases, it's like these highly scalable systems that are very optimized. So yeah. let's dig into that. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I do have some slides here that are good for, um, well, yeah, there's a, this is a joke. <laughs> Pandas is not the best API for data, um, but it is the best API for data for some people and for, and given the task. And so um, I do have a lot of strong opinions on this because like ultimately my goal from the beginning of this, of like my PhD and when I started this project has been to help empower people to be more effective at their jobs and to, to do better. Most people, whenever they choose a tool, they're choosing a tool that they're going to be most productive with. And I think that's actually smart um, with some caveats. <laughs> um, so uh, if you only know something that's very old and kind of archaic and you're the only person on your data team that knows it, maybe it's time to learn something new. Maybe it's time to kind of, you know, uh, work with your team to figure out what would be best for the team as a whole. So uh, the best API for data is in my very strong opinion, the one that you already know and the one that you are already productive with. The second best API for data is the one that your friend or your teammate knows so that you have somebody that you can go to for help if you if you get stuck or something like that. And then the, the third best API for data is one that you have to learn from scratch. Um, there are lots of reasons to choose a new tool. Um, API, I think, is actually a good one. If you if you find a new API that feels more intuitive or that feels more natural to you, then that's a that's a great reason to adopt a new tool. Um, but but data is like a social phenomenon, right? You're you're not operating in a silo. You have to basically communicate your findings to your friends, 
to your coworkers, to your boss, to your boss's boss, right? You have to, you have to be able to tell them what you did. And so if you're just barely getting by figuring out how to use a tool, that's not, that's not the best way to kind of interact with your data and, and produce these workflows uh, and, and communicate to, to your coworkers, right? If, if you leave, and you're the only person in the in the company that used tool XYZ, right? That tool, like nobody's ever going to be able to pick up your work again. So that's a really, really important and often overlooked piece of this is that, you know, be like choose the tool where you're you and your organization are going to be most productive and get more productive or or proficient in the tools that your organization is kind of choosing to use. How should this, um, if I may say team lead or product manager, how should I be thinking about this discussion? I think you've given some hints, but like how, how should I make big decisions for either what's being used in my product team or what's just being used in my software analysis team? Yeah, so the, the way that I would do it is I would start by kind of looking at what, what, what our requirements are and what our, what our team knows basically. What has our team been using in the past? Uh, if if you've been using pandas for the last ten years, but your requirements state that you your data sets are going to be too big for pandas, and you you have some some new requirement that comes down that says that you need to be able to operate on you know a hundred gigs of data, pandas isn't going to cut it anymore. So you need to you need to figure out a way to you you need to basically figure out the the best tool for your team. To, to kind of migrate to the, those new requirements and to kind of accomplish those new requirements. Um, it's very team specific. And so good team leads, they all know what their team is using. They all know like what their, what their whole company's data stack is. You know, if you're on a cloud data warehouse, if you're, you know, your company's totally adopted like the Spark workflow and this, this kind of uh, data lake house idea, you know, and anywhere in between. Um, it, it's all just very, very dependent and very individual. So the first thing though, that you need to do is look at the requirements and then choose tools based on the requirements. Because if you just want to live in pandas forever, um, and, and only use pandas, you're, you're going to get stuck when you try to hit those, those larger scales. I mean, that was a big part of my, my PhD was building a system that could like bypass those, those, those issues. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I think you're... There. Go ahead, Joe. Well, yeah, I've been there too. It sucks. Yeah, exactly. um, and you try and find workarounds around. You try and you know uh, uh, finagle like multi-processing and, and uh, Python, and you know go through the uh, start searching the limits. But then you find out, oh, there's this uh, processing will overcake it. But you try threading like the gill will get in your your way, uh, global interpreter lock, and so it's uh, it's uh, loads of fun. Um, you try dropping into C and deal with that. But it's like there's so many machinations uh, in pandas. We can talk more about you know stuff you're working on in a bit, but but I think what was it in your paper, the, you tried doing a comparison, like a transpose operation or something with, with yeah. uh, mode and paper. And I think it was like, what, six gigs of data or something? And then pandas choked or some, some number like that. It was yeah. a pretty small data set, actually. Like it wasn't, uh, wasn't significant, but like it didn't finish, uh, according to, I think, what I saw. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And pandas has this um, documented requirement that you should have 10, 10 times the amount of data as memory. <laughs> like you should have, if you, if your data set size is six gigs, then you should have 60 gigs of memory to be able to, to operate on it. Um, huh. And that, that's kind of, that's kind of steep a little bit. It's um, an expensive uh, machine. So. <laughs> yes, it is. It <laughs> is. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, but I think, you know, when it, when it was created, it, it wasn't created with the, these ideas of scale in mind. And I think that, you know, it's, it's been really interesting to see how the, the things have expanded. And, you know, now there's this ability to use Arrow as a backend, which is really, really interesting. Um, I think that, you know, Pandas has such a huge user base. I think the maintainers have done an excellent job, like not fracturing that user base, despite all of the changes that have kind of been needed over time. Um, they've just been kind of, rolling these changes out that are necessary and it's it's um you know it's been very good to see that you know they they haven't fractured their their entire community for historical context when did pandas come out 
Uh, Pandas came out. Uh, I have two thousand eight or something. Two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. it's it's old, but it's it, old. but you see, it's kept, it's kept up, right? But um, yeah, yeah, it has, and and there are five to ten million daily active users of Pandas. That's crazy. Yeah, a quarter of all a quarter of all developers use Pandas in their day job. All of I mean, all that's developers. Like, that's like a that's like if you picture a major city, and everyone's using Pandas. Like New York, yeah. for example, Matt. Like all of Manhattan's using pandas all at once. That's kind of nuts. Yeah, so. that's that's insane. Yeah, I mean the entire population of Missouri, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't sound quite as compelling, but <laughs> hey, come on, they got the Ozarks. It's it's it's, uh, it's cool. Yeah, so. yeah, the Ozarks yeah. are beautiful. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. But what's yeah? You know, what's next though? We can we can kind of talked about the. Uh, evolution of data frames and wh where we are today but you know you kind of, we kind of alluded to this too there's it seems like uh data frames are becoming first class citizens in different types of databases there's a lot of companies springing up you know trying to i think improve the pandas experience uh, and improve database experience distributing um you know data frames making data frames work better on one machine like i mean kind of walk us through all these developments and yeah where, where you think things are going yeah so it's been a it's been a really interesting thing to kind of witness and be a part of like all of these new changes there are new there are new tools and frameworks popping up like every year there's a there's a new one um and they're they're all good at, at at a bunch of different things um you know i can talk a bit about what what i've done in the past so i haven't i haven't talked about like the open source work that we did and at berkeley and that you know that i'm i'm continuing to work on but yeah, i mean mention, mention it it's, it's it's pretty cool actually yeah so um as a PhD student, I started this project called Modin, which is an, a drop-in replacement for Pandas. It basically keeps the same Pandas API and all of the all the semantics, and it just takes out everything underneath, um, all the execution and everything, and implements that in this new algebra and with this new data model. And now that we have this kind of data model and this data data frame algebra, we can think about how to optimize it. We can think about what what requirements we can loosen that were kind of a little bit too strict in the implementation in, in pandas, for example. Um, we don't have to store things as ordered, for example. We can kind of just say they're ordered and that's good enough, right? We don't we don't have to um, you know have this index be you know uh, the, the same implemented the same way that pandas implements it. We can have you know a more efficient structure for for implementing this under the hood. So um, the open source project that I started is called Modin. Um, oh, I already mentioned that. Sorry. Um, and um, yeah, we we did all of these things. Um, we've also been expanding this uh, in the startup that I'm currently working at with with Ponder, um, where we are basically mapping this algebra down to cloud data warehouses. So you can have a pandas interface, all the same pandas semantics. And it just executes directly on your cloud data warehouse. And all of this is possible because of the formalism that I talked about, and and because of the kind of, you know, the ability for us to to map these different data, data the, the different data models that exist out there to each other and kind of emulate different behaviors without actually having things you know, be concretely and specifically implemented in the exact same way that pandas does. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of problems have you run into in this implementation work? I mean, the, the devil's in the details when you start building product, right? Like you have a lot of great ideas. Let's map data frames to cloud data warehouses. What unexpected problems did you hit in building this? Yeah, um, a lot. So um, creating order and tracking an order is, is not as straightforward as you might hope. Um, so that was definitely one that's one of our like secret sauces, I, I, I guess you could say, is that, you know, we've we've been able to kind of map and create a a way of of maintaining order in a non-ordered cloud data warehouse where where their, you know, their data model itself is not ordered. Um, the index pandas pandas index or the row labels that's another piece that's that's been you know, incredibly challenging. Um, just because of how flexible it is, we treat it kind of as syntactic sugar on a on a column. So you have like a special column that 
that does certain things or that allows for certain types of interactions. Um, all the Pythonic stuff, like uh, like contain double underscore contains, for example, which lets you do value like six in i n and then the index. That that kind of stuff works in in Ponder, um, but it's still mapped down <laughs> to a, a relational database query. Basically, it, it, we we basically translate all of this stuff to SQL. So, um, but I would say by far the biggest challenge is just knowing knowing pandas incredibly well and knowing like the the order semantics of how how everything works if yeah. that makes sense like that that's something that takes years to kind of learn and understand and um yeah i mean having you know done the mode and the mode and open source work and, and all of the all the stuff there is was definitely a big help for understanding all of the order semantics <laughs> that the pandas allows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I still uh, see people get tripped up on is like broadcasting, for example. Like, like people try and still use uh, loops in pandas when it's much easier just to vectorize or broadcast your stuff down. And so I think that when you start uh, dealing with the data warehouse, though, I think this gets uh, infinitely more complex now because you're also, um, well, the meter's running. Um, so it's not like doing it on your laptop anymore. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, iterative right. approach can be pay paying iterative prices. And uh, yeah, I see some pretty uh, pretty crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, loops loops are don't use loops. So if I, if if you take away nothing else from this podcast, please please take away like try your best not to use loops. <laughs> like um, if you can. <laughs> That's uh, sorry, sorry. I'm like I'm very. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! I completely <laughs> agree, man. No, it's, it's, it's our say no to drugs moment. It's, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I I have to say it just because I see it so often. Uh, uh, you know, people try to run run workflows in the data warehouse using loops, or you know, on open source mode and using loops. And whenever you're in a distributed computing context, it just it it's so much worse. Like the performance just gets so much worse because you're you're literally trying to do an operation one row at a time, and because of our the way we manage metadata and the way that we, like there's there's there are a couple levels of abstraction there that we have to have in order to make things you know work in a distributed sense. You know it, the the performance penalty there is just going to be compounded. So yeah, don't use don't use loops. <laughs> I mean we, we've seen stuff like this. Like one time someone was trying to write some kind of JavaScript UDF for Snowflake and they were like trying to process one line at a time in the database. It's table, which oh, it was crazy. It was, was crazy. Craziest thing. <laughs> but I mean, oh if God. you come Very... from JavaScript, it probably totally makes sense. But then it's like, no, no, no. You need to think of this as a set instead. Oh yeah, no. They're, they're like, why is this writing so slow? And I'm like, I can show you why. Right, right there. That line. And they're like, well, that's how we write code. I'm like, not here. Um, so I mean, yeah, but, you know, right. in, in this case, there are built-in functions you could use, and the API. You know, in, in this case, Snowflake. I mean, it already had it, um, so that. But I think to your point, just knowing knowing the the SDK or the API is like I think like ninety percent of the battle. Just know the tools in front of you. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. But in your paper, I think it was you said a two hundred forty one um, uh, API uh, functions or something like that in, um, in pandas, which was, yeah uh, for the data daunting, frame alone. right? And it, yeah. and also yeah, you said it in data frame alone, and it was like these often duplicated workloads with like varying levels of complexity and uh, effort. So yeah, yeah, you can write something. So with with pandas specifically, you can write something two different ways and get like a hundred thousand x speed up. <laughs> like if you're writing it with a loop versus doing some vectorized operation or something like that, uh, you can you can get insane speed ups just because there's the the way that you write the query is actually how how it's executed underneath the hood, and that's a lot of the, the that's a lot of the kind of type of work that we've done to kind of not penalize users, for example, for, for how they for how they write their queries, right? Ideally, and when you write a SQL query, you're not you're not usually thinking about performance so much. It's usually like you can write it and then there's an optimizer and you kind of just trust that that optimizer is going to do a good job. And, and for the most part, a lot of them do a good job. Um, but but with data frames, there, there wasn't such a oh. picture. <laughs> And, and think about you know, think about things more holistically to, to be able to optimize them. Right? We have we have things like predicate pushdown in, in relational databases where you can take filters and push them down as low as possible. 
um, well, that didn't exist before in data frames because we just didn't have a way of reasoning about the operations that you might do. So, um, yeah. And to the point about API, I think, you know, our goal, my goal has always been to let people just use whatever API that they want and, and just have it execute on wherever their data is. Data movement is, is one of the most expensive pieces and one of the most time consuming pieces of, of anything. So if you have your data in a, in a, in a data warehouse, moving that data out to, to operate on it in like a, a Spark cluster or something like that. I, I know of teams that are doing this just because they prefer the Spark syntax. And, and so they, they take like, you know, terabytes of data, move it into this massive Spark cluster, and then they're they're operating on it because the Spark, the Spark syntax feels a lot more natural to them. And that that feels like a travesty to me because like if we could only just take those same operations that they're doing in in Spark. And, and run them directly in the data warehouse, things like the entire thing would just be so much more efficient. It would just be so much better. And you wouldn't have these like really, really long time consuming data movement issues or, you know, all of the issues related to just managing multiple different infrastructures that are doing the same thing. So there's, there's so many, there's so many kind of like complexities in, in moving that much data around that, you know, I would love it if we could create a world where people can just kind of deal with data in the way that feels most natural to them. And then it's just kind of executed wherever, wherever it is or wherever it makes the most sense. And I think you've kind of been alluding to this all along, which is sometimes we need to retrain our users to use a more scalable product. And you've already talked about loops. You've talked about Spark and how sometimes you want to retrain users to do things in the data warehouse context. What other challenges have you come have you run up against in terms of transitioning people from pandas to running things pushed down to the data warehouse? Yeah, so um, a lot of things it turns out we can optimize and it, it, they just work as is. Loops have been one of the one of the big issues. Um, there are lots of there are lots of kind of nuances that have crept up along the way around data types, uh, and those are things that that we've kind of discovered as time has gone on um, related to like, you know, categorical data types and, and how, how those are handled. I mean, a lot of, a lot of cloud data warehouses don't have first class support for a specific categorical data type, right? So the, the kind of uh, enum type or, or whatever you want to call it, right? There's not, there's not first class support in these things. So we have to actually build that first class support ourselves and, and, and manage all of the, you know, encodings and that kind of thing that, that you would have in normal pandas. Um, the but but in terms of like changing the user and like updating the user's knowledge, it, we only want to kind of empower the user and, and not make them not require them to learn an entirely new framework or entire like like ideally they shouldn't be thinking about the execution underneath, right? If they if they're doing that, then I think that we failed and and. Our goal is to basically let them just focus on their own productivity, focus on their job, right? Their job is not to execute things against the data warehouse. Their job is to, you know, do some analytics, create some report, uh, explore this data and figure out what's going on in it. And, um, you know, we want them to be able to do their job and do it as effectively as possible. If, if that means, you know, creating some you know, creating an R API, for example, or creating a, a bunch of other APIs. I mean, that, that, all that stuff is like in our mission and like on our, on our long-term roadmap is creating the ability for people to just go and interact with their data and, and do things. I mean, the most ridiculous thing about all this is like SQL, SQL itself is, is not a standard, right? So like this is this is one of the most challenging things. If you're if you're coming to to let's say BigQuery, since we've been talking about cloud data warehouses, you're going to BigQuery from Snowflake. There's a lot of stuff that just won't work. It just will not work because the keywords are different. The the the, the special the the special operators are different. Snowflake has a ton of a ton of like very very nice operators, and BigQuery doesn't have all those. BigQuery has operators that Snowflake doesn't have, and so there are all these issues related to just SQL, and we can't we can't even figure that out, right? We we as like a a, a you know a, a data ecosystem can't figure out how to make everybody have the same SQL keywords. So like it's going to take somebody coming and 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 creating the, these abstractions and giving people the ability to kind of operate in, in in a way that feels most 
most productive to them. And that like that's that's been like our whole mission. That's been my whole mission since since my PhD is to kind of allow people to just be productive, just do their jobs. <laughs> they just people just want to yeah. do their jobs. <laughs> Do you have any opinions though on who should be using SQL and who should be using uh, like interfacing with data frames? So that's that's a that's a tricky question um, for for a number of reasons. I mean, I interpret it as a tricky question just because like it's so individual specific. So if you if you feel like you are most productive interacting with data in SQL. And you can do the, the thing where you like write a SQL query and then check check it in the in the console and then build up a little bit more, right? I mean, we've all done that, right? We've all tried to try to build our big SQL queries one tiny piece at a time. If you're very productive doing that, then then I think more power to you. Go and go and kind of do that. Um, I think that like all all of this kind of revolves around the idea of productivity. All of my my kind of thinking around these topics revolve around individual productivity and getting people to kind of be more effective at their jobs. And so if your team is a SQL team, then you should be using SQL, right? If you're the only person using pandas in that, in that SQL team, or you're the only pe person using something else, um, you know, it might be time to start <laughs> learning SQL and, and not be the one who's kind of off in your own world. And like I said, um, data is a social phenomenon. There's, there's, you have to be able yeah. to communicate to your, to your coworkers and that kind of thing. If your entire team is on pandas and you're like the lone SQL person, it might be time to start learning pandas. The, 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 the knife cuts both ways and the, you have to kind of figure out the best way to, to, to work in the, in the, in those kinds of contexts. So, um, yeah. And just, just for, from a, from a practicality standpoint, it, it makes sense to learn both anyway. I mean, just to be able to speak both, it makes sense to kind of have some ideas about how both work at a high level. You don't need to know the specific, you know, snowflake syntax for, you know, how to convert a date time to some Unix Unix timestamp or something like that, right? You don't have to know all of these things, but understanding how, how it works, I think uh, is, is really important. Yeah, definitely understanding the trade-offs too between different approaches, I think is super key. Yeah, to your point, there's, I don't think there's any one way to do anything. There's many ways. There's also many ways to hang yourself if you're not careful. So that happens a lot. So yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Patty has a question here. It's something I've been thinking about too, given our discussion. Um, it's huge. Sorry, it cuts off your face in the uh, screen here. Um, so uh, SQL offers explain. Uh, yeah, just stretch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, look at a little kid. Uh, do the uh, more advanced data frame libraries offer an equivalent for uh, their execution planning? Uh, do any offer a setting to prevent execution if the estimated time exceeds a timeout? Uh, this would be useful uh, for ad hoc EDA and so on. So Yeah, these are great questions. So... Um... So I can't speak specifically about, um, I don't want to misspeak about any other data frame libraries. I can talk about what we've done with, yeah, with Ponder. Exactly. And specifically, like we, we, do have, uh, we do have the ability to specify a timeout. Explain is also something that we, we have a prototype for. Um, it's a lot more complicated than you might imagine because the, the algebra and the operators are, you know, not the same. And so the, yep. the ability to look at that you know, we're, we're kind of testing this with a bunch of users basically, but, uh, in general, um, yeah, you, you need the ability to time out if you're, if you're operating against the database, uh, especially if it's like, you know, terabyte, petabyte data, like a, a table that's like a petabyte, right. Um, you don't want to accidentally set off a query that's going to do yeah, like <laughs> you don't want to spend three thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, this could go bad too because you really you hit can. you hit run. Yeah, you think it stops it. It's going still. That's right. right? Yeah, in your yeah. notebook, right? And yeah. then all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> what just what the hell just happened here? Then you got to yeah. then you got to crawl on your knees to Google or AWS or Snowflake and say, yeah, I didn't mean to do that. They might be nice or they might not. Who knows? Um, That's right. Yeah, I think That's this right. is a huge huge crux right now uh, with notebook interfaces and. Uh, uh, cloud data warehouses that make you pay as you go because it's it's sort of the wild west i think we've seen things where it's um if you know what you're doing you can manage it but even if you know what you're doing it's still pretty hard because uh, again you don't have the transparency of okay this query is going to operate this way maybe consume this much data and big query maybe consume approximately this many credits and uh 
Snowflake, and uh, yeah, you might be in for, for a world of surprise. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, you, you totally could be. Um, yeah, it, it, it's you can accidentally spend your salary overnight. I mean, I don't know that that's ever been the true like uh, in in history before, where you accidentally have a runaway query. You, I mean, it, to your point about notebooks, right? It, traditionally, when you hit Control C, uh, that kills it, right? Or you know, you you stop the kernel. Or something like that. That that's mm -hmm. things. Well, how many things times have you had to stop? Oh, okay, how many times you had to stop a kernel in your notebook? Yeah. And you think that process is done, but the back end stuff you kicked off, it's still running. That's right. Like, so it's, that's right. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, Danny has a good. Uh, Donnie has a good. Uh, I think kind of closing out question here. Um, for those who need to force themselves to learn pandas and have lots of SQL experiences, uh, experience. Um, what are some of the best mental models to carry over, and which will trip you up? Yeah. So, so uh, this is a really good question. So there are some there are some books uh, out there that are are really helpful for learning pandas. I can I can uh, mention one if it's helpful. Yeah. Um, so Matt Harrison has a book called Effective Pandas. I think that that's one of the most most popular uh, pandas books, and it teaches you a lot about how to how to chain methods. Um, it, it teaches you everything that you need to know to kind of be effective at pandas, if that makes sense. So, yep. um, it's a very good book, uh, that I, that I do recommend, um, in terms of, of mental models. Um, so it's, it's quite different, but at a high level, if you bring your SQL experience and you're kind of like, uh, if you think about pandas as you know rigid typing and that kind of thing, you can actually be more effective at at certain operations. You can um, you can effectively have this idea of a tidy data frame, which is like something that would fit into the uh, into the, the the SQL data database kind of experience. So um, R has this concept. I, I don't know if folks are familiar of a, of a tidy data frame or tidy frame, yep. um, and it's it's basically kind of this relational relational database style th uh, way of interacting with data. But but at a high level, pandas is imperative. SQL is declarative. By declarative, I mean you give everything up front. You have to you have to specify your entire query. From from the panda side of things, you can do things piecemeal. Um, I would say never use in place. Um, that, that will trip you up. There are, there are folks who, who do swear by in place because of, uh, the idea that it might save you memory and that kind of thing. But if you look under the hood at, at how pandas implements things, a lot of times in place is just, it's still copying and it's just replacing a pointer or something like that. So it's, it's not actually saving you a ton of memory. in, in most cases, there are lots of things that can trip you up like that. And so for like, I highly recommend uh, the book that I mentioned, Effective Pandas, because it will give you some idea of those things that will that will just trip you up if you if you come from other worlds. So, um, I hope I was helpful there. It, it's um, it's a uh, it, it can be a lot to to kind of learn pandas from scratch, and 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 so um, you know you're. Your coming from SQL should be an asset. I, I do think it is an asset. Having having that idea of you know what a table is 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 a lot more uh, helpful than than starting from scratch. Although, like we talked about earlier, if you transpose, I think that's like sort of the uh, mind melter, right? So when that's I got right. into pandas, it was I needed to find a way to um, come up with a basically an automated way of featureizing machine learning uh, data, and this was back in like 2012, 2013 or something. And so I tried. Java's Guava library at first, and that just didn't really work. Then I came across mm -hmm. pandas. I was like, hmm, this seems cool. Out of the box. It's like, yep, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden I'm making data sets ahead, like tens of thousands of columns in some cases. And you know, this sort of blew people's minds because like, oh, how is this possible? This that doesn't make any sense at all. Because if you're from the database world, you're like, this is it's too big. Um, but hey, everything's a number. Don't need to care. So yeah. that was, uh, that was, uh, I think a big revelation at that point. Uh, but yeah, I think it's one thing too, it will trip you up. It's just the, um, you know, cause you're so used to thinking in terms of columns and rows and the thing in uh, data frames, as you point out that, well, these could be the same things actually, you just flip them and yeah, away you go, um, which makes you really uncomfortable. So 
You, know, you can, yeah, you can. So, you know, especially when your uh, when your columns might actually out outnumber the uh, number of rows you have. You're like, doesn't that violate like some uh, sort of laws of mathematics and as well? Um, so, uh, <laughs> see more yeah. variables than you have. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, anyway, man. Yeah, great, great chat. Uh, really, uh, it felt like this is a great deep dive. Um, uh, for people who want to learn more about you and, and what you're working on, how can they do that? Yeah, so um, I like I said, I'm working at Ponder. Um, if folks want to email me, my email is devin at ponder.io. Um, the stuff that I'm doing is, is also there. Um, yeah, so ponder.io, you can check it out. Awesome, cool. Um, any upcoming stuff, Matt? Uh, let's see, nothing too much at the moment. How about you, Joe? Um, nothing too much at the moment. I'm just going to be trying to knock out um, a course this week. And um, nice. I think next Monday, so it's it's a holiday in Utah. It's not a holiday anywhere else. It's Pioneer Day. It's when the pioneers came from great places like, I think, Missouri, perhaps, um, to Utah. Um, and um, anyway, so Monday is a state holiday. I, we're going to do um, Monday morning data chat still. Uh, we got Dave Langer. He... Um, He's an Excel guru. We're going to talk about all things Excel. So uh, it's the, uh, I think Matt and I always call it the dark matter of data. It's everywhere. Um, so 2 billion users or something like that, maybe more of spreadsheets in the world. So uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so I will um, I hopefully be on the call. I'm going to be trying to uh, tether for my hotspot uh, in Wyoming. So we'll see how that goes. It's always um, an adventure, yes. It really is. Might get eaten by a bear along the way too. Who knows? Uh, so... Anyway, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I got dropped some podcasts this week. Um, got uh, Benny Benford. He's dropping tomorrow. Uh, he was the um, chief data officer over at uh, uh, Land Rover Jaguar. So a uh, pretty interesting guest and uh, many more to come. So anyway, great chat. So thanks to the audience yeah. for the great feedback too and great questions and participation. So it seemed like a very popular topic. Love to have you back on again at some point. So yeah, thank you. I'd be yeah, happy to so. back. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Take care, everybody. See you next week.